It's Nancy Mace versus Jen Gibson for South Carolina House District 99. In this edition of Quintess Close Ups, I speak exclusively with Democratic candidate Jen Gibson one on one. And be sure to download the free Quintess Close Ups app in your Apple or Google Play stores. And listen to this interview later on iHeartRadio. Jen Gibson. Hi. It's so good to see you again. It's so good to see you too. I appreciate it greatly. Yes. Well, uh, let me take it back because obviously you're running for South Carolina House District 99 as a yes. Democratic candidate. Mm -hmm. And you just mentioned this to me just a few seconds ago, but we're two weeks before the general election. Yeah. Where are you as a political candidate? Uh, busy. <laughs> Unbelievably busy. We are trying to reach as many of the voters in District 99 and share our vision and our ideas and what my campaign stands for with the voters so that they can make an informed decision on November 6th. What is your vision for House District 99? Uh, a district that sends a representative that has a proactive approach to some of our greatest challenges. Education, healthcare, infrastructure. We need to be forward thinking for the next 20 years, not for the next year. And that, that's something that I think our current legislature um, is missing. I think we're very reactive right now. We need to become more proactive. From now on to 20 years to now, um, let me ask you this. What is the vision for House District 99 if you were to be elected? Well, uh, we've got two, uh, we've got multiple things. So we've got Highway 41 oh, yeah. over on uh, the Mount Pleasant side. We have Canoy Plantation in Clemens Ferry. And then in Hanahan, we've seen tremendous growth in traffic problems. So uh, traffic issues uh, over the next 20 years are going to be some of the greatest challenges for those residents living there. And we need a comprehensive solution. It's going to include public transit, it's going to include widening roads, it's going to include new roadways. And we need to have a very forward-thinking approach um, and a very long-term approach about how we're doing that. And then also education and health care. If you don't have those two things, you are not going to have a functioning, productive society that can make the most of our economic uh, benefits. We've got some great companies here in South Carolina. Let's make sure that we're getting those jobs. You talk about infrastructure in the House District 99. Where is your confidence in the Department of Transportation? It, it still remains low, but I think it's, it, it is a function of how it's set up. Okay. Um, we need to make substantial changes to the way that our state functions. So, for example, the Department of Transportation needs to be under the governor's office. Um, it needs to be appointed and accountable to them. Um, right now, there's too much influence by the legislature and commissions, and there's not enough accountability. So that's one of the problems. And then the legislature needs to help set a vision, and we need to make sure that we're funding it. I think that's a fundamental problem, that for a generation, we did not fund our roads. And we did just recently see a change in that, but it is a case of too little too late, and we're, we've got to figure out a plan how we catch up and get ahead of it. And that brings me to the discussion about gas tax. Where are you in this discussion? You know, for years we had the lowest gas tax in the country, and I am all about having lower taxes. No one wants to pay taxes, but it was at the expense of our roads. And so I think that it was a mistake to take that savings if we had charged a proper tax like most other states do and maintained our infrastructure we would have had better business opportunities and I'll tell you this we would not have the huge bill that we get from these emergency maintenance I can't even imagine what the Wando Bridge is going to end up costing us when it's all said and done. You talk about the Wando Bridge where are we right now with this what is the status of that bridge? So the, the bridge is currently, uh, they're putting a redundant system of cables in, which I think is a very responsible thing to do. And I think what we need to be asking ourselves is, um, how do we have a future contingency plan so that if something like this happens again, we have a plan? Um, I think we also need to be asking ourselves, how do we have other roadways if a bridge does go out um, due to some incredibly unforeseen circumstance, how do we move people about the low country? And so that may involve creating alternate routes. Um, and that's something we need to look at because at the end of the day, um, one bridge going out crippled this town. And that's not the best way. If we had had a system, a, a water ferry system, if we had had a bus rail transit on an independent line or something, 
that could have gone a long way in helping move people around the area. And so we need to be more forward thinking and have multiple approaches. There is no one silver bullet answer. And you talk about the area. Can you talk to me about the history of the House District 99 in your mind? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a lot like a lot of other House districts. The legislature gets to draw the lines, and the legislature, for a generation, has drawn the lines to benefit the individual legislatures. And that includes both Republicans and Democrats. Right now, we can point to all 124 districts and say, oh, that's a Republican district, or oh, that's a Democrat district. And you can look at so many districts that did not have and do not have challengers because it is considered an unwinnable seat. The way that it is drawn, it is drawn to go a certain way. And so District 99 was one of those. It's one of the largest districts. I, according to a couple people I've heard, it's the second most gerrymandered district. Okay. Jim Merrill won in 2000. And for 18 years, he was unchallenged. No one even ran against him. There is no accountability in that situation. So it comes as no surprise to me that he was indicted on 30 counts of campaign fraud and corruption. And was in, and, and found guilty, and now he's cooperating with the uh, prosecutors. And it is that kind of mentality that has created this culture of corruption that allowed Scanna to happen, that's allowed uh, special interest groups to dominate education and dominate transportation. And South Carolinians need a choice. Uh, they need someone asking questions and promoting alternate ideas. We need a better balance. It's been a generation of Republicans in the House, the Senate, and in the governor's office. And in the U.S. News World Report that came out this week, we're 45th in the country for overall state and we're dead last for education. It's not that it's the Republican Party, it's just that it's this group of special interest people that have had hold of the government and have been using it for their own personal benefit for too long. It's time for public servants to come back into government and fix the problems in South Carolina. What are those special interest groups in your mind? Uh, in the education field, it's people that have to do standardized testing, it's people that sell curriculum, it's administrators that uh, lobby special interest groups that are advocating for legislation. Um, I know that ALEC, uh, a, a substantial lobbying group, has influenced some of the legislative choices here. And in transportation, uh, there's certain companies that have uh, definitely have a stronghold on what's happening in uh, transportation infrastructure. You know, in the insurance industry, Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, they are a major player here in this state uh, with the ACA exchange. And, you know, my opponent accepted money from them. And I don't know how you regulate a business and an industry when you're taking money from it. Um, to me, that is just such a tremendous conflict of interest. Describe to me the following one word, ethics. Morality. I don't know, that's the word that pops into my mind when you say that. So ethics is about doing the right thing. It's just about doing the moral thing. Um, of course we can talk about all the different uh, laws. I, I think it just comes down to do the right thing and be transparent about what you're doing. Um, that's it for me. Scan of Santee Cooper. Uh, yeah, we just had some more research come out, uh, something with, with yesterday, and I continue to think that we need to make sure that the people that profited the most uh, are going to pay the biggest price. And that includes shareholders of Scana. Um, they are the ones that reap the benefits. Uh, some of the people that have golden parachutes. We can't just throw our hands up and say, oh, that money's gone. I do think we have to aggressively go after them because somebody's going to have to pay the bill. And you know, even if the Base Load Review Act is, is found um, to be unconstitutional, that money is still owed to people. That money is still gone. And we've got to figure out a way to bring it back. Um, if we lose Dominion, it just brings, and I'm OK with that. I'm not necessarily pushing Dominion by any stretch. Okay. Um, I just think we have to be aware that I don't think we're having the right discussions. I don't think we're having the right the discussions about where do we get the money. It's clear that we don't want ratepayers to have to pay it, but who is going to pay it? And that's the question we need to be asking. And and you know we keep saying protect the ratepayers. Well, I agree with that, but that's not a solution. That's just one part of it. So identify where the money went, attempt to get the money back. And you talk about people, obviously, if you were to be elected to South Carolina House District 99, you'll be covering parts of Mount Pleasant, Long Point, Snowden, Rivertown, Dunes West, Planters Point, some parks west, uh, the Phillips community, Van Allen, most of Clemens Ferry Road, and of course, Hand. 
And Goose Creek. And that's Sorry, right. Goose Creek. <laughs> Sorry, you love Goose Creek. Yes. <laughs> but when you go around to these particular areas campaigning, mm -hmm. what are people telling you about the House District May 9 race? Um, you know, I'm hearing a couple of things overwhelmingly. Uh, infrastructure. Okay. Education. The high cost of health care. And uh, people just concerned about civility in, in government. That, that, that really seems to have uh, gone by the wayside. And I'm really hoping that we can, can bring that back and, and work across the aisle. That's something that I'm really excited to do. I've, uh, you know, on the campaign trail, it's so great when I see the Republicans and Democrats coming together to have town halls and forums. Great ideas are exchanged, compromises are made, uh, you see other people's perspectives, and it only benefits the voters to have these kind of discussions. My opponent has made statements that she, uh, her voting record is public and that she won three elections in a row and so she doesn't need to, need to have those dialogues again. And I just don't think that's true. I think that's the mentality that got us where we were with Jen Merrill. And that is one of the reasons why I'm running and why I will run again in 2020, no matter what happens, because we have got to hold our elected officials accountable. They have to be coming up with more creative ideas. They need to be challenging the system, and they need to be working for South Carolinians, not just uh, using it as a stepping stone for their political career. Now, when you take off your political hat as a candidate, who is Jenny Gitson? A mom. I mean, without a doubt, that would be my, my number one thing. That, um, and I would actually say, even when I have my political hat on, I'm still a mom, first okay. and foremost. Uh, I'm a wife. I'm a daughter. Uh, I still have three parents here in the area that I, you know, I love, and I love that I'm able to be with them. Um, and I'm a small business owner, and I'm excited to uh, focus on that. Uh, but like I said, I feel like it was just... After all my experiences that I went through in the past two years, um, I just felt that it was a calling, that it was time. I'd identified these problems. I had the resources to navigate them. So many other people didn't. And the answer to me was to get involved and change it and do something about it. And so, you know, it's almost a ministry to me that, uh, you know, it is time to, to take care of people that have been left behind in the system through no fault of their own and, and give them the tools they need to work their way back into our society and participate in the education, the healthcare system, and the job market. Jim Gibson, thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate this. Thank you, Quentin. I appreciate it. Thanks. Well, <laughs> Good to see you. Likewise. <laughs>